Um, so hi everyone, thank you so much um, for joining me today. So as Bhaskar said, um, this presentation is going to be um, about successful storyboarding um, and ways that you can successfully, successfully use storyboarding um, and storyboarding tools and templates to create a winning bid that is compliant, easy to evaluate and make sure you get um, as high a score as possible in your bids. So let's have a start with what is storyboarding. So when we think of storyboarding, we do tend to think, well, I know I do, tend to think about the storyboarding you hear in films and TV, um, where storyboards are used as a visual representation of how your film or story will play out shot by shot. And in bidding, is basically exactly the same. So it has the same purpose. Storyboarding basically helps you organize or mock up your bid response to help you plan, develop, and review um, what you're going to put in your response, what you're writing in your response. So um, if we have a look at planning, so storyboard, uh, storyboarding can help you plan what needs to be included in your response. It helps you plan how you're going to present it. it can help you plan around any restrictions. So things like um, word limits, character counts, page limits. We know how great those are in the bidding world. Um, so it can help you plan around those restrictions and it can help you plan um, around the elements required from the evaluation criteria and how to include those. Um, it's also storyboarding is going to help you develop your bid response and your answers to your questions. Um, so it's going to help you think about what you need to include to achieve top marks. It's going to um, make you think about um, inclusion of tools such as call out boxes, benefit boxes, case studies, references, all those great bidding tools that we use to really help our bids stand out. Um, and finally, um, storyboarding is going to help review um, the, the bid, your bid response is going to help you make sure you've allowed um, for all elements of the question to be answered, make sure that um, all required attachments, perhaps there's appendices that have been asked for, um, so all of those have been planned for and then reviewed. Um, and again, we come back to that evaluation criteria, it's going to help you review your response is um, covers all the points of that evaluation criteria. So, so that's a little rundown of what storyboarding is. So why use storyboarding? Um, so I've got, I've got five key reasons of the benefits of using storyboarding, but um, I'm sure there's, there's many more. I am a big fan of storyboarding. So these are my key fi five key ones. Um, so our first one is compliance, and you're going to hear this word a lot um, through this um, presentation because compliance is really important in bidding. I mean, it, we all know it can be the difference between a high score and a low score, and in worst case scenario, disqualification from a bid if we've not been compliant with client requirements. So storyboarding is going to help us identify those client requirements to make sure that we let the client know we're compliant. And it's also going to make sure we're compliant with um, the elements of the question that need to be answered. Um, secondly, um, storyboarding is going to help your evaluator read the bid more easily, which in turn means that they're going to be able to evaluate it more easily. And we're going to see how we can do that with things like signposting. Um, so that the evaluator knows where they are in the bid, they can check that all the answers and elements of the answers um, questions have been answered, and they're going to be able to give you higher scores because it's going to be easier for them to give higher scores because they're going to be able to evaluate it based on that criteria. Um, thirdly, why you storyboard in the benefits are it differentiates your bids from competitors, so it reminds you to use things like um, value add and innovation, cost savings, and make sure that those benefits are highlighted to make sure that you're differentiating your bid from the competition. Um, next, we've got evidence. So um, storyboarding is going to 
um, make sure that you include your evidence and use placeholders for that. Evidence, again, so important when uh, we're writing or producing bids. And you're going to hear me talk about evidence a lot in this um, presentation as well, because it's so important. And um, storyboarding really helps you um, make sure that evidence is included. Um, and all those, those four categories ultimately then lead to probably the most attractive benefit of all for those of us in the bidding community, um, that it increases our productivity. Because we've got a clear plan in place of what needs to be answered, what needs to be written and how we're going to write it, it's going to save time rather than just having a blank piece of paper in front of us and thinking, right, how am I going to start answering this question? Um, so it's going to make it easier to write, save time to write, that's increasing productivity and ultimately that will reduce the stress of your job and helps you meet those deadlines without getting too um, stressed about it. So. Let's have a look at the four principles of storyboarding that I've got here. So um, number one, understanding the requirement. And we're going to look at all four of these in more detail. So understanding the requirement. So firstly, asking why is the client asking for this question and why? Why is it important to them? Secondly, analysing the questions. So ensuring that, again, compliance and all elements of the questions are answered, as well as that evaluation criteria to make sure that we're getting those top marks. Thirdly, developing the response and defining your offer. So this principle of storyboarding is really putting the meat, the meat on your bones. So sort of one and two are getting your bones ready, um, your storyboard, and then number three is actually getting that solution and your, your approach um, designed and written and put in to your response. Um, and then number four is creating key visuals. And when I talk about visuals, I'm not um, talking just about things like infographics and photos um, and diagrams. I'm including the use of things like color tables, um, call out boxes here as well, which all help um, highlight key parts of your bid. So let's have a look at these elements in a bit more detail. Um, so understanding the requirements. So I've got three main features of understanding the requirements when we're talking about storyboarding. And number one, which is probably the most important one, is client focus. So client focus, client focus obviously hugely important when we're writing our bids and putting our bids together and if we've got a good capture team a business development team then in theory we'll already have um, hot buttons and pain points captured from the capture phase um, that will help write the bid in the first place so that client focus should already be there but it really helps us ask the question why is the client asking asking this um, secondly that word compliance again so understanding any comp compliance requirements, there might be specific accreditation, uh, accreditations we need to carry out the service, or there may even be legal requirements. There may be specific training that the client wants you to carry out. Um, so systems that are used, so compliance, again, really important to understand the requirements. And then thirdly, evaluation, which again is gonna be a repetitive theme in this, um, presentation because that evaluation criteria is what we need to focus on to make sure we get those high marks. So um, understanding what that evaluate, evaluation criteria um, is and understanding how we need um, to get the maximum marks from that. So let's have a little look at an example that I've got and I'm going to use this example throughout. So I've tried to use quite a sort of standard question that hopefully everyone will have seen in bids, um, whether public or private sector, which is about subcontracting. Um, and I've also included an evaluation um, criteria example here as well. So I'll give you a read of the question. So the client wants to know, how will you ensure that the subcontracting of works which do not have specific specialist requirements are kept to a minimum? Where subcontracting is required, including specialists, provide details of how integration, quality control, and management will be undertaken. 
And then I've only included what you need to get the top mark here, which is that excellent, because that's the, that's the mark we, re we really want. So we don't need to look at the other four, three, two, and one. So how do we get that mark of five? Um, so the client has said to be to have that compliance requirements and get that excellent score, then your bid needs to meet and comply with all the requirements of the question and further indicate innovation in operation. And secondly, they've given us a little elemental breakdown here, which is even better, where they've given us some bullets where they've said, um, your question, your answer really needs to fully answer the question, which is the subject of the response. And the, the response needs to be supported by relevant evidence. So there's our question. Let's put it into practice with our, um, with our storyboarding. So here I've got a little table, which brings up those three elements that we just talked about, the three elements of understanding the requirements. So let's have a look at how we start storyboarding this answer based on these three areas. Um, so we'll start with client focus, and I'm, I'm only gonna go through a few bullets here um, because, because of the, the time we've got. But really, if you're putting a bit together, you could have a whole workshop based on this element um, with people in your bid team. So the modelers, the capture guys, business development people, um, subject matter experts to go through what that client focus is and the reason for the pain points. So um, let's think about, let's ask the question, why is this question important to the client? Why could they be asking this question? So there's a pain point or hot button there. And, and that client focus starts with the, they want to minimize subcontracting. That's what they're basically saying in that question is we want to make sure that um, subcontracting is minimized in this contract, um, in this bid. So let's ask the question again. Why would they want to minimize subcontracting? What could be the pain points associated with that? So, and again, this is just me having a little brainstorm and we could do it in sort of a workshop environment or when there's more time, we can really sort of knuffle into the bones of why they're asking this question. But potentially, um, as I've said, it's a pain point for them because they've had previous subcontractors maybe who've not aligned to quality standards. There may be an additional cost, margin on margin. There's countless reasons that this could be a pain point for them. And if we've got that, sort of capture element and good business development phase um, prior to the bid coming out, then we'd know a lot more about what these pain points are to really be able to focus on it um, in this response. So we've got our client focus. Now let's think about the compliance elements of subcontracting and what, and what that requires. So um, really obvious one is probably specialist requirements and accreditations. So if we're going to subcontract, um, which they've said, if it keep it to a minimum, but if you are going to subcontract, tell us this information. So they're likely to want to know the specialist requirements, specialist accreditations your subcontractors hold, and also things like legislation and due diligence. So prompt payment um, standards that we have in the UK and subcontractor due diligence to make sure that um, we've done our research on the subcontractors we're using. And then evaluation. So we've read through our evaluation points to get that five marks. So let's not forget, we need to understand the requirements of the evaluation, which is quite simple here. They've basically asked that it fully answers the question and indicates innovation, and that you've included relevant evidence, case studies, and experience. So this is our first part of storyboarding. We've got our client focus. We've thought about the compliance for the question and we've thought about the evaluation criteria needed for that question. Um, so next we're going to go on to analyzing the questions. So another really important part, storyboarding. So firstly, we want to identify all elements of the question to make sure that we answer all elements of the question. And what we're going to do when we've identified all elements of those questions is turn them into signposting within our bid response. So for any of, the, of you who haven't heard of signposting before, it basically does what it says on the tin. Um, it acts as a signpost for the evaluator and they're reading through your bid, but they have something that sort of hits them in the face, if you like, like a signpost. 
um, that basically says this is where you are in the bid you you know where you are um, and this is how you carry on and you know where your next signpost is to see where you are next in the bid so it's basically telling them what part of the question is being answered and where and then we've got that lovely evaluation criteria again uh, making sure that we've we're analyzing the evaluation criteria and what is included in that that we need to include in our response to the question to make sure um, we're getting those full marks so let's go back to my subcontractor example um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to read through this question and see if you can identify the elements of this question that need answering um, you can use the chat function to just give some numbers um, once you give a couple of well, so I've given you some minutes to read through. Don't forget the evaluation criteria as well. Have a read through that and see if there's any elements of that that um, perhaps need to be, we need to um, answer in the question. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to read through and then we'll have a look at uh, what answers we've got and I'll, t I'll tell you what I've got. Perfect. Thank you, Catherine. Yes, please do take a minute or two, read the question, and uh, let's go. So what does the attendees need to do, Catherine? Um, so if you've if you once you've identified any elements, just put, put, put a number in the chat function of how many elements that you think you have found that need uh, need to be answered in that question and evaluation criteria. Okay, right. Let's see who gets this. <laughs> Wow, four and six seems to be the popular yeah, one. Yeah, four and, four and six. We've got three there. Four. Make sure you remember to look through the evaluation criteria as well for the elements in there. Got five. It's good. Eleven, five. Right. So let, let's have a look. So I, I identified six. So there's no, there's no wrong or right answer here, but it, the idea is to make sure you're breaking that question down as much as you can. Um, so let's read through the six that I got. So how will you ensure that the subcontracting of works which do not have specific specialist requirements are kept to a minimum? Oh. Sorry, Bhaskar, my um, presentation has stopped moving. So how, how will you ensure that, number one, the subcontracting of works which do not have specific specialist requirements are kept to a minimum? So that's your first question that they want answered. Where subcontracting is required, including specialists, provide details of how integration, number two, Quality control, number three, and management will be undertaken. So there's your four in the question. Now let's not forget the evaluation criteria. So to get our excellent, we need to meet and comply with all the requirements of the question. Now I'm not highlighting that part because we know from what we've just highlighted above that we are meeting all elements of the question. Um, and further indicate innovation in operation. And then we've got our elemental breakdown of fully answers the question, which is the subject of the response, which again, as I've ex explained, we've just done that with our question, but we also need to include that the responses were supported by relevant evidence. So there are our six elements of that question. And then going on to using it for storyboarding, what we want to think about is how we then turn those identified elements into our signposts. So let's get them all down in our list. We've got the minimizing subcontracting works, integration, quality control, management, innovation, and evidence. 
Um, and what we want to do is turn them into signposts or as otherwise known as telegraphic headings. And so a telegraphic heading is basically a heading, like I said, that acts as a signpost that tells the evaluator what part of the question is being answered. Um, so we could potentially go one step further with this and then turn those telegraphic headings into informative headings and then even turn those informative headings into theme statements. But that's a whole different webinar. So for now, for this webinar, we're just going to leave them at tele telegraphic headings for now, um, which is the, basically the simplest form of heading that we can, that we can do in our bid. Um, I always like to use the client's language um, because that's the language that they've used um, and it makes it easier for them to then relay it back to their question. So these are, these are the telegraphic headings, the signposts that I've come up with. So we've got ensuring subcontracting works are kept to a minimum, details of subcontract integration, details of subcontract quality control, details of subcontract management, innovation in operation and relevant evidence. So those elements that we've identified in the column in our purple column, we've now made into actual specific telegraphic headings that we that can then use as placeholders in our bid response templates. Um, and then finally, let's not forget our evaluation. Um, we need to make sure the questions are fully answered, innovation is clearly included, and relevant evidence is clearly included. And we don't need to use um, turn these into separate signposts because we've already got them, because we identified them through our identifying all elements. But we always want to make sure we go back to the evaluation criteria because it's really important that um, we refer to that to get those high marks. So um, I'm going to give you another example just to try. Um, it's a little bit more detailed and a little bit longer. Um, just because I think this is such a, an important um, part of storyboarding is to analyze these questions. So I'm give, gonna give you a couple more minutes to read through this new question. I've not got evaluation criteria this time, just the question. So we'll do the same as before. Um, put your numbers you get in, in chat. Um, Baskar, if you can read out the numbers for me this time, I'm not gonna press the chat because I'm worried that's what <laughs> broke it last time. Um, so I, I don't want to make I don't want to um, have a delay and go back to the slides. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to read through that, and then um, we'll see what numbers people have come up with this time around. Perfect. Thank you, Catherine. We love you. We like quiz. We like questions. Bring it on. Um, nice. Two minutes. So they still need to find the evaluation criteria, a number of elements, right, Catherine? No, we're not using the evaluation criteria this time. We're just, we're just reading through the question and we're just identifying the elements of this question that need to be answered. Oh, wow. Okay. So I'm the one who is not listening properly. Others? <laughs> My God, you are very quick readers. I'm still in paragraph. Okay, last 30 seconds, maybe. So what numbers are we coming up with? We are getting all the way from, I think the average is somewhere between 10 to 12 at the moment. Okay, that's good. One is seven, uh, but mostly 10 to 12, one, nine. Seven, nine, 10, 11, 12, that's the number so far. Okay, uh, br brilliant. Let's, let's, have a, let's have a look. Um, so, because there's four bullets here, something to be careful of, and it doesn't sound like anyone has, has done this, um, but sometimes having bullets in questions can be misleading because it might make you think that what there's one bullet per element. So you might think, oh, yeah, there's only four elements here because there's four bullets. So I'll just use those as my, tele my telegraph headings and my telegraphic headings. Um, but I actually counted 12 in this. Um, so let's let's have a look at the 12 that I found. Um, so we've got, please explain how your organization will handle the transition of the new contract, including understanding the specific requirements at the client site. Your method statement should include the following, experience of implementing staff, including induction, 
and how you will ensure that staff have suitable experience. Your answer should also outline what your processes are. So there's four, just one, two, three, four, just within that one bullet. How you will manage the relationships with the site manager. How you will strive to continuously meet a good level of service and maintain a good level of service and minimal level of complaints and how you address any areas for improvement around the estate and communicate this back to the client. So there are our 12 elements of the question that we've identified. So let's do the same thing again and let's put them into our, our little table, our storyboarding table. We've got the transition of the new contract, specific requirements at client site, implementing staff, induction, staff have suitable experience, processes, relationship with site manager, meet a good level of service, maintain a good level of service, minimal level of complaints, areas for improvement, and communicate to clients. And then we want to do the same thing again and turn these into our signposts in our bid response and turn them into our telegraphic headings. So again, I've used the same language as the client in their question. How we will handle the transition of the new contract, understanding specific requirements at the client sites, experience of implementing staff, now for these next three, where we found the three, the four within that one question, um, these ones aren't bold because these can actually be used as subheadings for the experience uh, of implementing staff. So then we've got staff induction, ensuring staff have suitable experience and processes for implementing staff, all then as subheadings that experience of implementing staff. And we've got managing relationships with the site manager, which was that bullet two striving to continuously meet a good level of service, striving to continuously maintain a good level of service, ensuring a minimal level of complaints, addressing areas for improvement around the estates and communicating areas for, improve, for improvement to the client. So this question is gonna be you know, a big question to answer because we've got 12 tele, telegraphic headings here and we haven't even included an evaluation criteria. So it's just an example of how, um, how much detail sometimes clients are looking for in their responses to questions. And um, to, that's why it's so important to do this analyzing part of storyboarding to make sure we've got every element of that question covered with an answer. So let's go on to um, principle three of storyboarding, which is developing the response. So this is, as I said before, where we really want to start putting the meat on the bones of our, of our storyboard. So we've got the understanding of the requirements, we've got the analyzing of the questions and the evaluation criteria, and now we've got actually answering the question, putting the meat on the bones. So this is the approach, what our offer is, what are the differentiators going to be, what are we actually going to do as, as our solution? And then we want to make sure that we are providing evidence to support that approach. So where we've done it before, um, case studies, evidence boxes, and then finally benefits. So what the benefits of our approach are. So we can highlight these with things like feature and benefit tables, value add, innovation, uh, qualitative and quantitative theme statements. There's lots of ways that we can highlight the benefits. So Let's go back to our lovely little example again, our subcontractor example, and you can see now that our storyboard is really coming along. So our storyboard is now turned into more of a mock-up, like a template of our response answer. So we've got the title here, subcontractors. I've included the question um, from the client because I think it's always really important to put the, the, put the question in that is being answered so that the evaluator knows what question is being answered. And then we've got our six telegraphic headings in array there. So we're going to have a look at the first telegraphic heading, 1.1, just because we don't have time to do all of them, uh, which is the ensuring the subcontracting of works are kept to a minimum. So if we start looking at our approach, this is where we go back to our client focus in our understanding the requirements part of storyboarding. And this is where we can start putting the information that we brainstormed there into our approach answer. So this is where we would start identifying what those pain points were, what those client needs are around using subcontractors and, minimize, and why they want to minimize subcontractors. Um, 
We might want to think about the in-house capabilities that we have as, as, a, as a bidder that um, would potentially minimize those number of staff available um, for those in-house services, number of years providing in-house services. Um, and uh, once again, like when we uh, were identifying the um, client focus and understanding the requirements, you could have a whole bid workshop on this area of developing the response where you start thinking about what that approach is and writing down points for the approach that needs to be added into the response to that answer. And then next we come to evidence. We need to make sure that we are supporting our approach with evidence. So some examples I've given for this question might be a case study of a similar service provided in-house, so not subcontracted out for a similar client to evidence where we've done it before without using subcontractors. Maybe we want to evidence the accreditations that our staff, that our in-house staff have. Um, maybe we want to do something like add in the percentage of services um, needed to subcontract, um, as long as it's a low number. So for example, we will only need to subcontract 1% as a specialist requirement because that's showing them that we're minimizing subcontracting. And then we come to our benefits part of the table, which is what are the benefits of our approach to the client? Well, number one, the most obvious one is we're um, minimizing the use of subcontractors, which is the whole point of this question that they've asked is they want to know how we're going to minimize it. So that's our key benefit of all these elements of our approach. Um, and then I've added some other examples that, that might be relevant to this question. But again, you could have a, have a full workshop to come up with what the benefits of your approach would be. Um, so value for money. I've just put a nominal figure in there, for example, 10% saving, continuity of work, for example, a one team approach assurance of high quality service and all these all these things are really linked to that understanding the requirements of that client focus element of storyboarding so we've kind of come full circle so that brings us on to the final principle of storyboarding which is creating our key visuals and as i said before when i talk about visuals here i don't just mean things like diagrams and photos i mean making the bid visual so number one, for example, highlighting that key inf inf information. So that can be through call out boxes, using color, using highlights, using bold text, using um, larger fonts. So all the ways that you can highlight key messages and key benefits to the client and the evaluator. Um, and then uh, another benefit of using um, key visuals, uh, good visuals for storyboarding is making your answer easy to review and understand. So this is where, for example, infographics would be really useful for uh, maybe um, minimizing a lengthy um, model, a lengthy methodology that's been written into the approach to make it easier to understand. Um, and you can also use visuals as a way of signposting as well. So you can use call out boxes to signpost throughout the response as well. And then finally, we need to make sure that any key visuals used really support the message that we're saying. So those wind themes, those hot buttons that we've come up with right back in the capture phase that have been brought through to that client focus and understanding the requirement phase and have since been put in our approach phase of um, developing the response. So we need to make sure any visuals we do use, whether that be um, photographs, illustrations, um, flow charts, tables are relevant and um, support the message and your wind themes that are being said in the text. So they're not just sort of, you don't just have a random photo in your, um, in your response in your storyboard. Um, and a, a benefit of this is the, the repetition because using repetition where you've got something in a call out box as well as in the text next to it, or as well as in a photograph, as well as in the text next to it, an inf infographic, is that repetition helps people remember. So if we're repeating those key messages um, by visuals, as well as in the in the core text, then it will help the client remember those, those key messages and those wind themes um, for when they're evaluating. So let's have one final look at our storyboard and where we are now. Uh, so you can see it's really, really come along now. We've got um, our title, we've got our question. So I've 
we can see under 1.1, we've put our answer that we've drafted in the developing the response uh, the, um, part of the storyboarding. Um, and I've also included here a feature and benefit table, which came out of part of developing that response, but in terms of visuals, so that will act as a signpost of here's where our benefits are to you right at the top. It's kind of slapping the client in the face. Here's the benefits to our approach. Um, and I've also got some call out boxes here as well. So I've got an evidence box and an innovation box, which helps that ease to review. And those evidence boxes and that innovation box, those are gonna be used as signposts as well as the telegraphic he headings. So we can now actually get rid of our innovation telegraphic heading and our relevant evidence telegraphic heading because we've now got them in call outs. So it's even easier for the client to review those parts of the bid and tick off that evaluation criteria that we've got evidence there, we've got innovation. And not only is it, it's now not even hidden in a telegraphic heading, it's staring right at them in their face in a, in a big call out box, in a big colorful call out box. Um, and then we finally got supporting our message. So I've got an example of a case study I'd want to include in this evidence box, which would be about that self-delivery and that re repeats and supports the message in the text about that delivery. So that, so that is our final storyboard. And then we're, we're ready to actually go and write our response. Um, so, so that's it. So all that's left really is for you to go out and try storyboarding if you don't do it already. Um, it's, I think it's a brilliant tool to help plan and write a bid. Um, as we summarize what we've just talked about, it's a great method to make sure that you're um, developing and planning and reviewing what you're going to write in terms of the response to questions. The benefits include compliance with the bids, it makes it easy to evaluate, there's clear evidence, benefits, um, it, it saves you time, um, so there's great benefits to it. And then just as a reminder, the four key parts of storyboarding, understanding the client, analyzing the question and developing your response and creating key visuals. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I hope you found it useful. And I think Basca is now going to open the floor up to any questions anyone might have, and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. <laughs> Catherine, thank you so much for this. I think, you know, while Catherine is answering, if you do enjoy this webinar, which I know I have a lot of questions, please say thank you to Catherine in the chat. I'm sure she'll be happy to get you all your love and so forth. So while you do that, let me ask few questions that we received. Actually, we've got a lot. Uh, Catherine, so you ready? Okay. <laughs> Try my best. <laughs> Don't worry. Question number one from Aurora. What's the best way to create a storyboard? Does a storyboard look like a proposal template with annotations like add a call out box here? This was at the very beginning of your talk. I think you know, you covered it in step by step. But is there anything you want to add because you went through a four step process in yeah, yeah, so I think uh, hopefully I did answer that by my end sort of my end storyboard, which was basically a complete mock up of what our bid question, our bid response to that question is going to look like. So I think like it, it starts off as like a table format with that, um, that first um, understanding the requirement section. And then from there, going through the four processes, we can build, starting with sort of a blank sheet of paper, we can build what our storyboard and then our template and the mock-up is going to look like. And then we've got our placeholders and telegraphic headings and everything in there that we want to make sure that we're answering. Perfect. Thank you, Catherine. Again, um, do you use any software, Catherine, or do you just use uh, Microsoft Word? So I don't use I don't use software. I would um, I would always use Word because the bids I work on are usually produced in Word. Mm -hmm. So I would say to produce your storyboard in the format or the program that you're producing the bid in. Um, I, if you're using graphic designers, for example, who are going to be putting it in InDesign, it might be easier to storyboard in Word first, and then that can be handed over to the graphic designers to work their magic. But um, I, I just use Microsoft Word when I do it. Perfect, thank you, Catherine. Um, again, this was very early on, most probably, I, I think uh, now Piyush might not. Is storyboarding same as creating a bid plan? Um, pot potentially, yeah. I mean, it, there's there's separate principles for bid planning and and storyboarding. So, um, planning is sort of a lot. Bid planning is sort of a lot more around project management and 
um, those elements of, of bidding as well. For example, something that wasn't part of the storyboard, but would be part of a bid plan is, I'm gonna say compliance again, but a compliance matrix and a deliverables matrix. So those parts of that have been identified in a deliverables matrix and a compliance matrix could then also be pulled out into that understanding the requirement element of the storyboard. Mm. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Pius, hope that was useful. Um, I'm just going back from the very beginning, Catherine, because this is just before even you started your presentation questions came <laughs> based on your. Right. So Sarah, Sarah is asking, you know, she used to use a wall to display storyboards and walk through the storyboard with the team, literally walk the wall. In this good old days of working from home and virtual working, how can we do this virtually with the team? So I think you could still, you could use a SharePoint document. So, I mean, um, I, I don't know what sort of SharePoint tools that you might be using, but for example, if you um, use, um, we use Microsoft Teams and we've got SharePoint within Microsoft there. So you can have a shared, a shared document um, where you could have a Teams meeting and have that document and develop that document. And you wouldn't be able to have it on a wall-to-wall -wall wall room as we used to in the good old days. Um, but you'll definitely be able to have a folder on a network where you've got sort of individual um, storyboards for each response uh, question. Got it. Hope that was useful. Um, yeah, used to use the virtual tools, Microsoft SharePoint, um, Sarah. But thank you for that question. Barbara is asked, I'll come back to the Q&A questions in a minute, but Barbara checks, you know, client focus. You know, we talk about client focus, uh, but other than nudging people, sending them reminders, hey, your response need to be client focused. How can we ensure that the response is client focused? Any suggestions? So I like to just continually ask that question to yourself. Why is the client asking this question? And I think if you keep asking yourself that as you read the question and you can see how we did it in understanding the requirements. Um, so that was based on no information from a capture. I mean, you know, the idea is we all have a lovely capture team who has that client focus and can tell us pain points. But if you really haven't been given any insight into that at all, is really try and have a think about why that why the client is asking that question. So if we look at that example we used with the subcontracting where we looked at, you know, why is the client asking? Why does the client want the subcontracting to be minimized? And although we don't know this for sure, because We've not spoken to the client because we haven't got that capture team and ideally we would have who'd have spoken to the client who would know for sure but we can as we can assume it's because they've had a bad experience with subcontractors which in turn helps us to think about that must be a pain point for them and what their hot the hot button might be nice thank you catherine that was useful catherine rita has a double barrel question one is like do you go through a storyboarding process for bids that has a short turnaround say two and a half three weeks to respond if so how do you do that that question number one question number two is do you have a structured template or a framework that you use for storyboarding um so Yes, I would do storyboarding for a two to three week bid. And I actually think those are the bids where it would be most useful for, because like I said, one of the benefits of using storyboards is it helps you save time. Mm -hmm. um, and although it might not seem like it because it looked like, you know, that four stage process, we've got to go through that to get our storyboard. In the long run, it's a lot quicker um, to storyboard a response out than to have a blank piece of paper in front of you and think, you know, how am I going to how am I going to start answering it? And even if you did have a blank piece of paper and start answering a question, then you would sort of half heartedly half half heartedly be storyboarding anyway. Um, I don't. I, the templates I use for for storyboarding are the templates for my bids. So that example I gave for the final one, that would be how one of my bids would actually look like. So if you've got a bid template, I would storyboard into the template you use. So it's basically like a live document that then becomes your bid eventually. That's nice, hope it was useful, Rita. Um, Barbara comes back with the question, key visuals, how much is too much? So I think APMP says, I think it should be um, one, I think one visual per every two pages. Right. I think that's what it says in the book. But don't quote me on that. Um, but I, but I think that's quite a good rule of thumb to go by is, is one sort of image or visual every 
every two pages. If you're talking about call out boxes, in my opinion, I don't think you can ever have too many call out boxes if they're, if they're used as evidence boxes. And I've used bids before where all down the right hand side of my bid, I've just had evidence, case study, evidence and case study, because it's so important to support your, your response. Perfect. That's good. I think there is a lot of thank you messages for you, Catherine. I'm sure when you browse through, you're going to see people love this presentation. Thank you. But let me continue with the questions. How do you consider storyboarding when you have different levels of audience in oral sessions, executive to operational level? You know, I mean, like who should be the audience of your storyboarding? If you have a varied levels of expertise within the room, how do you make the best use of it? So I think storyboarding is probably most useful to those who are going to be writing the bid. Mm -hmm. um, so bid writers, but also the, um, the bid managers as well, who are sort of basically managing that time and managing the project and who also might be writing some of these standard questions at least. Um, I think it's useful for um, for especially your solution experts and your business development team and, pot and potentially more senior people to be involved in the storyboarding process but maybe not at each part so for example when with that analyzing the question stage two when you wouldn't need all your technical experts and, and senior management at that stage, that should be something that the bid manager and bid writer is able to do. Mm. But with your understanding the requirements, especially around that client focus phase, you really need as many people involved who have been speaking to the client and who have those client insights um, involved in that. And then when you go on to developing your approach as well, you would need, I'd have thought everyone involved in that bid in the room to make sure that all the client pain points are being captured and that you're answering the question correctly as well. Perfect, Catherine. Thank you for that. I think Sean asked, I hope that was useful, Manish. Sean asked the question again, do you have a standard storyboard template? I think you answered that already, you know, your slides, more or less if you follow the process with the four, four parts, Sean, I think most probably that will be useful to you. Um, so um, Rita checks, what's the difference in storyboarding for companies that don't work with public sector? I'm talking about commercial proposals where there aren't any specific evaluation criteria, no compulsory questions, still it is a proposal. Do you use evaluation criteria, the information that the salespeople tell you in the absence of any capture information and business development work? That's a long question, Rita, well done. So I, I think where you haven't got any questions, so for example, they've just asked for a proposal to be submitted of the works. I think the most, most of those points of storyboarding can definitely still be used. Obviously, um, phase two, analyzing the question wouldn't be relevant here because there's no question or evaluation criteria to analyze. But the understanding of the client and understanding the requirements is still going to be relevant whether you've got a question to, to be answered or not. Um, and then developing your response and the tools and templates you would use to highlight benefits, to highlight evidence is still, is still relevant whether there's a question or not. Same as the key visuals. So I think in that, um, in that example, you just need to remove the analyzing the question element. Perfect. Thank you. Hope that was useful, Rita. Um, Mandy, presentation will be shared in the next 48 hours as per the early things. Don't worry, you'll be fine. Um, Let's go, okay, a few more, let me go, questions. Um, I have used, this is from Neil, Neil is asked, I've used many different storyboarding annotated outline mockup tools and templates and tool diagnostics, successfully making sure all the goodness from these make into proposal is the trick, especially if you do these early in the bid timeline. Any thoughts on this? I think question is we can sit and do storyboarding, but most of the time we forget and we go and answering the responses. How do we ensure that the storyboarding is actually lifted and brought in the actual proposal, Catherine? Well, I, th I think the answer to that is to be using the, the response template that you're going to be using to write the bid. So you'll see how I developed it. I developed it into a Word document that then would become the bid response. So mm -hmm. um, whereas you can use tools and you can use Excel spreadsheets to do it, you've then got to convert everything that's been put into those tools onto the format or into the form 
of the template that you're going to be writing your response. So if you start it in the template in the first place, then it's already there ready for you. And they're already there as placeholders. So you can't really ignore them to not include them. Perfect, perfect. Thank you, Catherine. Catherine, what some of the wrong ways of doing storyboarding? So I, I don't think there really are wrong ways to do storyboarding because if you're doing storyboarding, you're already doing better than not storyboarding. Mm -hmm. I think um, the I think wrong ways of storyboarding would be to rush it, to not think about it properly, and to just be sort of writing standard um, standard examples in rather than actually fully thinking about what the client wants and understanding those requirements. Um, I think I've seen storyboarding happen before where. Um, people have used that analysis of the question part and they've missed out really important parts of the question. So they've, they've missed whole chunks of the question out because they haven't analysed the question properly. So, I mean, that is an attempt at storyboard, but doing it sort of incorrectly. But I think it, as long as you start doing it and you become experienced doing it, then um, you'll, you'll get easily get into the process. And, and it's really very, very easy to do. It's not a hard thing to do to help improve a bid. Totally, Catherine. As you rightly said, you know, there is still this inertia of storyboarding. I'm not expert. I don't know the solution. I don't have the sales knowledge to do it. But bringing people together, brainstorming in good old ways, asking why do you think we should win the bet? Who are the competitors? And uh, what's stopping us from winning, etc. is pretty much what this is all about. And then uh, you kind of nailed it in a structured way today. Any final questions? before we move into Scribble Quest. Catherine already asked two questions, so I'm not gonna ask any more questions, but there are one more, which will last part of the Scribble Quest. Uh, but please do ask your questions in the chat box, or if there is anything else you would like to share to Catherine on your storyboarding experience, now is the time to do. But for others, the Scribble Quest starts now. Get ready to the chat. Um, and uh, if, you want to if you want to share, again, browse through Catherine in the meantime, all the chats that you have, all the love and support that you received, so let me ask you questions. So nice that you pulled out the slide as well. What's that one word Catherine mentioned you will hear more in this talk? Very early on, she mentioned that whoever started first might have got this answer. Oh my God, John, that's very good. John, Rita, I think you all nailed it. I'll give points to all of you. Keep coming. Um, Oh, perfect. So whoever said comp compliance, that's the answer. Yes, end of the day, you do need to comply. Uh, just while talking, thank God I've deleted my own questions. Not good. Let me go to the trash, find the question. So question number two. Well done to everybody who picked up compliance as the answer. You all are winners. Um, but uh, but uh, Rita and Sean, you picked it very early on. But again, with the timing, it just eight seconds. That's good. There are four principles of storyboarding that Catherine mentioned. What are those four principles? This might take slightly longer for you to type. Uh, if you want to go abbreviation, it's fine. But what are the four principles of storyboarding? Piyush, you are human. <laughs> Literally, how did you actually manage to type this fast? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. You, are, you know I'll be asking these questions, don't you, Piyush? You have been attending all the webinars, so you, you got my trick. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, Sean, you took time to type, and Piyush, I know you did it. So that's four. I know, and don't worry about others. So all of you who tried it, um, it's it's four things. If you, if you get these four principles nailed down, at least remember these four principles, everything will fall in place. That's the biggest takeaway for me. You know what? Keep understand your clients, analyze the question, develop the response, create the visuals, beautifully written structured process. That's your template. Whether you do Word, whether you do PowerPoint, whether you do you know, InDesign as Catherine pointed, it's irrelevant, but follow a structured process. Brilliant, thank you. Well done to Piyush, um, Sean, Rita, and others who tried. So uh, what are you know, the three elements of the storyboarding, which is point number two? You know, the very, very first uh, question was about client focus, and we talked about compliance. And what's the third one? <laughs> Catherine, did you see how attentive the attendees are? Except me, everybody seems to listen carefully. Um, 
that, that's the answer, evaluation. So yes, client focus, absolutely, as Mandy pointed out early on, or Sarah pointed out, I think, how can we bring client forces focus to it? Absolutely. Next is compliance, you know, ensure you answer compliant and finally keep evaluation in mind. That's the point is. So that's the end of this particular webinar. So thank you so much, Catherine, for joining. Hope you enjoyed it, Catherine, yourself, and I'm sure our listeners and our audience enjoyed. For all the people who will be catching up, repeating again, webinar and slides will be released in the next uh, webinar, will be available on demand within the next 15 minutes. Recording will be available for you to watch in our YouTube channel in the next two to five days. Slides and related resources will be out in the next 48 hours. So thank you for all your contribution. If you like it, go back to LinkedIn and uh, comment on this post, tag Catherine, say you're loud there so that you make Catherine happy. And it also gives us a little kudos in the back. We are, are not doing any lecture next week, um, but we'll be coming back for the 16th June. 16th June is very special because we will be hosting um, Rebecca Link, the chapter leader of the year. And uh, we will also be celebrating with Rebecca. So if you're part of the NCA chapter, it's an absolute must for you. But if you are our regular webinar attendee, please do join in. We will be celebrating Rebecca's success part of this. That's 16th of June. You know where the details are, log in, watch the answer. But Catherine, thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for sharing. And uh, thank you all for attending. I will see you on the 16th. And uh, if you are joining our foundation workshop this week, I'll see you um, third and the fourth. Otherwise, all the very best. Take good care. And for our UK friends, enjoy the time and the journey.